And um, as Nick said, um, I'm actually a clinical geneticist, not a neurologist, but I've spent a, a long time around neurologists and doing a lot of research in this area. And of course, a lot of the um, recruitment, as Henry has shown, the 100,000 Genomes Project um, may have been around neurology, but a lot of that recruitment did occur through clinical genetics as well as neurology services. So I think what I'm going to start by doing is really, in a way, just setting out the, the challenge that is, I think, a major one. So um, as Henry said, and Nick said as well, uh, there's an awful lot of progress being made in terms of identifying um, patients who might have specific uh, genetic causes for their conditions and many new genes are being identified. Um, but the question still holds as to how well we really understand diseases of the nervous system and how well we're really able to, to address the challenge um, for, for patients in terms of living with those conditions and uh, potentially having treatment for those conditions. So if we try and see, you know, what, what do we need to know to, to know that we've understood a disease? We might want to know the genes that can cause that disease or similar diseases. We might want to know that we can provide a genetic diagnosis for the vast majority of cases. And for many of the genes that um, or conditions that Henry and Nick mentioned, that's becoming the case, which is incredible, really, in such a short, short space of time. Can we also provide patients with an accurate prognosis for what will happen to them over the course of their lives in, 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 in the, these diseases? And most importantly, can we provide patients with disease modifying therapies? That's the real acid test of how well we understand it. So what, what's hindering our understanding? I, th I think part of what's hindering our understanding is that there's actually quite a big jump between um, identifying a gene that causes a specific um, neurological disease and the patient's phenotype. There's, there's a lot that's happening in between. Now we've already heard a little bit about what's happening in between in terms of the MRI imaging. We've also heard a little bit now as well about what might be happening in between on the methylation status of many of the genes. And my focus has been for a long time on using that step of RNA, of transcriptomics, as something that's proximal to the DNA, but not the DNA phenotype, to try and understand how uh, mutations and genes actually connect to what happens in a patient. And I guess a key step in that is, is asking, you know, do we really know the genes well enough? Do we know what the RNA transcripts are that are produced by individual genes and what are the implications of getting that wrong? And also, can we use um, omic data sets, given that they're getting larger, to try and understand um, how patient phenotypes, even uh, sort of lesser phenotypes of a major condition, might have a molecular underpinning? You know, are these coincidences or causes, central causes to the condition? So just to address that first question of, you know, how well do we know the genes? So if, if I put here a map of the world from the fifth or sixth century, and, and the reality is, is that um, you know, we, we might not be so far off. Our map is a bit better than that when it comes to the genome, but it's, it's not necessarily that much better. And when it comes to the brain and the brain transcriptome, that is the RNA that is produced by genes in the brain, um, or, or the, the RNA copies there, we might argue that we know less than, than we might imagine, in a, as it were. Um, you know, we, we often have had problems sampling. We've often sampled at just overall brain level or big regions. We haven't necessarily had an opportunity to get to really cellular resolution. We don't know necessarily so much about how these genes are regulated or their methylation status or all the transcripts. We don't know how they change over time. So there's a lot we don't know even when we know that a gene causes a disease. I'm just gonna address one of the major questions, at least for my work, which is about um, gene annotation and literally knowing the exons and introns which make that gene and which actually um, can be used to form transcripts. So wh why do we need gene annotation? Well, gene annotation is pretty fundamental. So um, gene annotation is absolutely core to diagnosis. So of course you can't find a mutation in a gene if you don't know all its exons. And even when you know its exons, you need to know the transcript structures or you're not going to be able to interpret what a variant would be expected to do in that transcript. So is it a missense? Is it actually expected to be a protein truncating variant? What do you expect it to be? And that depends on the transcript structure, that essential map. Of course, there are also implications for quantification of gene expression and implications for interpretation of GWAS hits and complex neurogenetic disorders. 
So we set about building a workflow to try and improve gene annotation, um, specifically for genes that are highly expressed in the brain, and with the aim of trying to improve diagnostics by improving that map. And this is really based on the assumption that we probably don't know these genes as well as we should. So I'm not going to go into this pipeline too much, um, because I think in the interest of time, but I think the core thing is to know is that what we were using was RNA sequencing data from the Genotype Tissue Expression Project, which has sequenced 13 um, regions of the central nervous system with around 100 to 250 individuals um, being available uh, or contributing to that RNA sequencing data. And this is control data. We then use this RNA sequencing data to identify what we call expressed regions of the genome and to then connect them to known genes using um, RNA sequencing reads, which sit across that novel region and a known uh, region of the gene and which represents an exon-exon junction. So we might classify these expressed regions as being within intergenic space, um, intronic space, exonic, exon-intron or exon-intergenic. And we simply can count how much of them there are. So here what we've done is actually look at all the tissues in the um, GTEx project. And you can see them along the x-axis. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but if you look at the first plot, which isn't just red, but is more multicolored with blue, you can see that they're all tissues on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, this is the total expressed regions of the, of the genome that we're measuring. And we've classified those regions in terms of whether they are um, intergenic, intronic, exonic, so on. And we've ordered the regions based on um, the amount of novel expression, intergenic or intronic expression, which would not be expected based on current annotation. And you can see that all the brain regions come up right at the top here with cerebellum having uh, the most novel expression. Here in the second plot, we've just focused on intergenic regions, and you can see that it's really quite clear that there's a lot more novel expression occurring in human brain than in other tissues. And the question is, is does that matter? So uh, in, in the most, uh, I'm going to just tell you one aspect of this, but um, we connected these novel expressed regions to known genes, as I said, and we then asked ourselves, well, okay, which genes are we re-annotating? And if we look in actual fact, the genes we're re-annotating counter to our expectations are genes which are highly enriched um, within the OMIM catalogue. So these are genes which are known to contribute to Mendelian disorders. And in some senses, we would have expected them to be better understood. Um, there are also genes which have been implicated in neurodegenerative diseases based on GWAS analyses. And so we feel that actually this data is, is important. And I think particularly looking at the OMIM information could have implications. So I'm um, just taking a specific example here of SNCA. I know this is quite a complicated plot, but I'll just take you through it in brief. Um, at the very bottom where it says genes ensemble 92, we have the gene structure of SNCA with its exons. And then what we've got is um, a section called frontal cortex, where we're looking at two types of expressed regions. In blue are expressed regions which map to known exons of SNCA, and in red are expressed regions which are not expected to be expressed. They map to either intronic or intergenic space. And I've highlighted a particular region here, and I've highlighted it because in fact, we've also got this track called split reads, which shows these um, reads which might represent exon-exon junctions and map precisely to the boundary of a known exon of SNCA and to this novel region. And in actual fact, we have split reads at both ends of this expressed region, suggesting that it might be part of a novel transcript. And given how much, um, how important SNCA is for Parkinson's disease, it's, it's really quite amazing to be able to identify any novel transcript of SNCA. So we actually find that in fact, this is not a rare transcript in terms of the number of individuals who seem to have evidence of expressing it. In fact, it was found in over 80% of the frontal cortex samples in GTEx. We've also been able to validate it in silico using um, additional data sets and experimentally, and even more recently through long read RNA sequencing. We know it's brain specific. We know that it's in a highly constrained region where um, mutations and in, in rare mutations in individuals tend not to occur, and that it's potentially protein coding and would have implications in terms of adding coding sequence. 
So just to sum up on this segment of what I'm going to tell you about, um, we think that improving annotation of disease causing genes is likely to improve diagnostic yield and may have other implications in terms of our understanding of some of these diseases. And this is an area which I guess I want to highlight to you is still important. And so if you get a negative result on a gene that you're really convinced should be the right gene for the condition, it might be sensible to look harder. So here um, I'm going to address another kind of way of using transcriptomic data, which is maybe more on the clinical end of things, which is to ask really whether um, you can use omic data sets to try and address questions that have been long hanging around. So, for example, in dystonia, people have recognized for a very long time that um, dystonia patients have a high um, risk of having mood disorders as well as an actual movement disorder. And in fact, 40 to 75 percent of dystonia patients will have an additional psychiatric dose diagnosis. But it's not necessarily clear whether that is because of the impact of dystonia on their lives or is actually primary to the way that dystonia is caused in the first place. Um, and uh, here I won't go into it, but it's quite an interesting situation with um, uh, Modli Modigliani's uh, mistress, who in actual fact was thought to potentially have dystonia because of its thickening of the musculature around the right sternocleidomastoid muscle from his paintings and pictures of her, and actually ended up jumping off a, uh, a fifth floor window um, with their unborn child. So quite a dramatic story, really. Um, so in terms of dystonia genetics, this has moved on massively in the last five to 10 years, with 28 genes now identified, and, and maybe that this, even this number is out of date now, um, which can give prominent dystonia in the absence of imaging or neuropathological evidence um, of structural changes on MRI. Um, we've also moved on a lot in terms of our understanding of complex neuropsychiatric disorders, such as schizophrenia, major depressive disorders, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder. And these GWAS are now incredibly powerful and incredibly um, uh, successful at identifying genetic loci which contribute to risk of these uh, neuropsychiatric conditions. So what we wanted to ask really is, um, do genes associated with dystonia and neuropsychiatric disease have common properties? And are these properties captured within existing omic data sets? So um, we actually looked at where genes are expressed in terms of the cellular specificity of their expression. And um, as you might have expected, at least for the um, uh, dopa responsive dystonias, then those genes are actually very highly specifically expressed in, in, in dopaminergic neurons. Um, and this was done using mouse data and also more recently using human single nuclear RNA sequencing data sets to, to do this analysis. We also find that actually many of the genes that give rise to um, dystonia are also very highly and specifically expressed in medium spiny neurons, um, you know, suggesting actually that this is a cell type which might be very important for the development of this condition. We also used, just as the last speaker described, um, weighted gene co-expression network analyses using um, all the uh, tissues, both uh, from GTEx and the UK Brain Expression uh, Project, to look at how genes uh, which cause dystonia might be co-expressed together and co-expressed with other genes. And we identified um, two modules which I'd like to focus on, which um, of co-expressed genes, one in the substantia nigra, one in putamen, which had an enrichment of um, genes which uh, are known to uh, contribute to dystonia when mutated. Um, we then used this module data to ask ourselves whether um, there is evidence that genes which have been identified um, through uh, the GWASs um, for major depressive disorders, OCD and schizophrenia, might be um, significantly enriched for heritability for these conditions. So if you look at the module composition and the genes within that module and you uh, run uh, LD score regression analyses, so these are analyses which look at partitioning heritability of disease across the genome, we were asking whether heritability of these conditions is actually enriched um, amongst uh, all the genes which uh, are also either uh, dystonia genes themselves or highly co-expressed with dystonia genes. And in actual fact, we found that there was a significant enrichment within one of the modules, which is actually in white matter for major depressive disorders, also the putamen cyan module when it came to OCD, and the same putamen cyan module that is very enriched for markers of medium spiny neurons for schizophrenia. 
And this would suggest to us really that it's not coincidental that actually this patient group um, have a high risk of neuropsychiatric disease. But in actual fact, the same genetic mutations which, um, and the same processes which might be giving rise to dystonia put them at risk of these conditions. And I think that's kind of key to thinking about these patients in a more holistic way and what interventions might actually be useful in terms of um, treating these patients. So just to end really, because I know it's very short of time and you probably all want lunch, um, but the aim of this was to give you a sense that actually we are now beginning to be in a position where we can bridge the gap between just identifying a gene and understanding how the, uh, that gene actually might give rise to a particular phenotype or problem or disease in a patient. And that actually this is really key to trying to understand where you might intervene and how you might understand the disease. And I think this is, is really important. Um, I also think that as the data sets uh, that in enable this are, uh, are being developed at such a high rate, I really think that we're going to start seeing change even within clinical practice on how we actually classify, diagnose and treat neurological diseases. And I expect to see those changes in, in my working, working time. So thank you very much for listening. I'm just going to acknowledge um, all the people in my lab who contributed to the work that Saul presented and also to collaborators, um, John and Henry, um, and also to Juan at the University of Mercia, Nicola Mencacci, who was at UCL now at Northwestern, um, and uh, colleagues at NIH as well. So thanks, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Mina. Um, I mean, just there's a question in the uh, chat um, from Lorio Blasquez about uh, basically based on uh, Yerna Yule's um, work on uh, precursor splicing and things. And it says, uh, how can you know if this expressed region is part of an intermediate transcript or belongs to a new functional isoform? So, I mean, I think that's a, that's a really good um really good question there and and I think we've spoken about this uh, before and, and we, we'd love to we, we do think sometimes that these uh, expressed regions we're identifying might be part of intermediate transcripts I think that is a possibility I think in this case I think it's actually probably not um, simply because of the um, level of expression that we're seeing and the consistency with which we're seeing that across samples um, we also now have the um, uh, the uh, long read sequencing data, which reassures me that um, the CR is incorporated into um, what could be a protein coding transcript of this gene. And so actually, I think in this case, I think I feel a bit more confident about that. Having said that, what we have noticed is that actually um, for some of the expressed regions we're identifying, there are signatures suggestive of, for example, alley motifs, which might suggest exactly the kind of idea that you're you're putting forward, Luria, that these may not necessarily be, um, you know, this might be a lack of suppression um, of, a, of expression um, that we're seeing in some individuals, but not, not all. So I, th I think this is a, I, I mean, I'd love to talk to you about it more. <laughs> um, and yes, absolutely. I think you, you raise a good point. There's a second uh, question, uh, which I think is an interesting one, I have to say. Um, Karen Sutherland asks about uh, whether the overlap uh, with dystonia and um, schizophrenia might give some insights into functional disorders. I mean, yes. I hesitate to get into genetics and functional disorders. Um, <laughs> so you can imagine you know, the network, neural networks that go wrong as to why you somatize and develop dystonic posturing or what have you. Um, it's interesting anyway. I don't, I'd be interested what you think of it, Mina. I'm handing it to no, you. No, I, I absolutely think that it's, um, I, I mean, I have to say as a clinical geneticist, I think there's two types of disorders where I think there's a really big functional component, um, which actually is probably basic to the process of that disease that may come across as if it's actually the patient, you know, complaining about everything and anything every time you see them, um, uh, but, but actually isn't. So I think, um, I, I actually do think this could have implications in that way. And I do think we're beginning to disentangle those issues a little bit. So, I mean, the condition I was thinking of is actually all the collagen patients. <laughs> so we have, yeah. uh, I get a whole load of Alice danlos syndrome patients with yeah. very difficult to treat pain, 
Yeah. Um, very difficult to treat patients in general who sometimes go via neurology mm. to us or other way around. And um, actually, I think there is something really there for them. Um, you know, I think probably we do need to look deeper into whether actually the relationship of their of their core mutations is actually very directly implicating on on um, you know mood and ability to cope with some conditions. Yeah, I I think it does. I think it is important. And um, this last question, and we'll uh, draw it to a close. Um, it's about a question about uh, where you looked across the putative new exons in the hundred thousand genomes in undiagnosed cases, see whether there might be enrichment for novel mutations in, in those newly defined exons. Yes. So actually, um, we, we haven't really done this at scale, I would say. Um, I mean, we have definitely passed on the, the regions to Henry, and I'd say that there's one patient who's a KIF1A patient with, um, uh, who, was, who, was, who I think actually really, you know, the identification of a novel expressed region within KIF1A was instrumental in us seeing that he, he probably does have KIF1A CMT. Um, so I, th I think that was, that's actually one situation. We, we haven't written that up, which I know Henry will probably tell me I should have done and, and should do more work, but um, still. <laughs> but I think the other thing we've actually done is we really want to, this is exactly why we generated the data. We think that um, I generated it and pushed this project because I think the move to genomes means that it is possible to re-examine a region in this way without saying to someone like Henry, oh, could you just resequence that, that whole redesign the WES capture to take in that new region? He doesn't have to do that. He, he can go straight back to it. So yes, I, I absolutely believe that um, this is possible and we're looking to try and pursue this. So if, if you're interested, please do contact me. Uh, I think it back up. So, so first, of all, what I would say, pulling all the talks together, is what what, what it shows me emphasises something I've been thinking about for a while. Is not only that we don't know the full genome, and Mina just talked about new exons in very well studied genes that we're still discovering. And so, if you don't know all the exons, you can't find all the mutations, and that's been discussed in the last question. But also, we can't describe design appropriate genomic therapies if we don't know what the genomic event is that's contributing to disease, loss of function, toxic gain of function, new splicing event. So I think we need a lot more genomic discovery before we really transition to lots of genetic therapies, would be my guess. But, um, Nick, can I just add one thing to that? I, I think sure. that's become even more um, important and compelling because actually in the past you might have said, um, you know, you'd have to direct a therapy against a protein product or against yeah. the pathway yeah. of that protein yeah. product. Now, actually, um, given the fact that, you know, uh, RNA uh, targeting therapies um, are really up on the rise and actually are being shown to, um, to, to be effective in, in many neurological or, or a, an increasing number of neurological conditions. I mean, I guess, you know, there's HT, there's Huntington's, there's SMA, um, there will be more. I think it becomes as if identifying the abnormal transcript is, is identifying for you the drug target. And I think that will really speed up the potential to, to treat these patients and, and increases the importance of thinking about neurogenetics and referring patients and diagnosing them. Okay, so I'd just like to draw it to a close. I'd first like to thank Brain for having the foresight for um, supporting this meeting. Um, I think it's it's got downsides that we're all online and not face to face, but that's got opportunities because it's mean more people can dial in from all over the world and listen to uh, these interesting talks. So I want to thank the speakers, uh, all the speakers this morning. I thought it was very interesting. I'm not, not including myself in those thanks, uh, but I'd also like to thank the IT support for this. It is incredibly difficult and complicated to get academics to do anything in advance of time. And so to get them to, so that we all behave semi-reasonably and um, behave. So I really would like to thank everybody who's helping behind the scenes um, uh, very much. And so I hope you all enjoyed it and the talks will be available and I think they're being recorded as well. So thanks once more.